Hello, my name is Ian Anderson. I'm the founder and uh, creative director uh, of the Designers Republic in Sheffield. Um, the first piece of graphic design I remember seeing is, you know, I don't know that I can remember the first piece. I, I know that I've always collected things that once you become a designer and you look back, you can imagine that, ah, oh, yeah, that's that's where it comes from. So I used to collect books uh, of flags and flag design, and I used to spend a lot of time, uh, being an only child, I used to spend a lot of time inventing countries and designing their flags for them. And that went on and I designed uh, a lot of football kits. So, uh, so those are the things that I think, and, and also I used to, collect sweet wrappers I, at the time I, I had no I had no idea that they were pieces of graphic design or commercial design I just collected them and I liked them and I like visual things and things that you could touch I can't really remember precisely the, the first piece of graphic design I saw but maybe that's a good thing maybe we should be remembering the the messages that that design communicates rather than the design itself. Um, but I do remember as a kid, um, I, as a school kid, I worked weekends um, at, at Sainsbury's in Bracknell Newtown near London. And um, I was always getting in trouble because if I had to stack the shelves, um, I always tried to make sure that all the all the fronts of the cans were facing the front, so everything was kind of in order. So I was going to get into trouble um, with the managers because I was quite slow. Um, my, my, my shelves looked perfect, but and I was always kind of a little bit pissed off when someone came and took, say, a can of beans or sweet corn that I'd just nicely arranged if they spoiled my display. So I, I think that that's when I started to become really aware of, of design. So that would have been, I mean, now we look back at sort of the classic um, packaging for, for Sainsbury's own brand, which looked very sort of modern at the time. But I, I mean, again, I didn't really, <clears throat> I didn't really think of it as being modern. It was just, it was just a repeated image. And, and then I remember there was a, a, a programme on TV that was based on Robert Hughes' Shock of the New book and, and, I just, you know, I started like learning more about Andy Warhol just out of interest, really, and seeing his like, repeated images of the Campbell soup cans, and and I thought that and that kind of that kind of made me laugh a bit because I realised that that's inadvertently what I was doing. So I suppose I started thinking in terms, maybe even if it wasn't a graphic design, but of thinking of, you know, visual communication in a loose, in in a loosest possible way. Yeah, and I think it just grew, and then obviously. The, the record sleeves thing came because I there was a there was a record shop in Bracknell called David's Records. It was an independent record shop. And it was on it was on my walk from school to where my dad worked, to the factory where he worked. And so I'd used to go and meet him and get a lift home with him. So I used to spend pretty much uh, an hour um a day uh just going through all the record sleeves. So again, I mean, I, I had a vast knowledge of, of, of music from the progressive rock era in the 70s, um, purely based on the album covers. I mean, I, a lot of the things, you know, I remember things like Gentle Giant and that. I mean, I don't think I've ever heard Gentle Giant, but I could tell you all the albums that they did um, if you wanted. Um, but, you know, so I think that there was lots of things that, that when I look back, if I if I didn't end up being like a you know sort of a you know a baker or a mechanic or something, then it wouldn't really have it wouldn't really amount to anything. But when you think of where I've ended up as a, a as a designer, then um, you know it all seems to sort of fit in. You know, sort of stamps, flags, football kits, record covers, packaging. But I don't think I was really aware of graphic design in terms of being graphic design until somebody told me that that's what I did when I thought what I was doing was designing record covers and somebody and a student came in for placement and said oh no what you're doing is graphic design so there we are that's what I'm doing 
So um, what am I working on now? This year, is, is, this year has been a strange year for everybody, obviously, but it's, it, it's strange in terms of the stuff that I'm working on because normally uh, a lot of the, well, a lot of the stuff is, a lot of my clients are music industry based or events based uh, or culture based and all those things are impacted. And what's happened is that most jobs I'm doing seem to be kind of stretched out. It's kind of like time stretching because deadlines keep slipping and no one's really too sure what's happening in the future. Um, and the urgency has gone. And so that if I don't manage my time in terms of delivery, it's really sort of difficult because no one else is really doing it. So what I've, what I've been doing a lot of this year is, is this year is the 40th anniversary of Pac-Man. And I've been working with UMAA and Bandai Namco in Tokyo. Um, they commissioned me to do um, a Designers Republic version so it, of, of Pac-Man. So it's not the game, it's the, the merchandising stuff and everything else apart from the game. Um, and so I started to kind of do a, a 40th anniversary update and then they kind of kept asking it. So, well, no, what we want is, is it to be a Designers Republic collaboration, obviously, you know, big in Japan. So, um, that, so that's what I've been working on. And that's, that's again, it, it's, it's a little bit more complex because it's not just straight design. There's a lot of back, things going back and forth um, from here to the other side of the world and to, um, so you, you, so that, it, there's been a lot, you know, it's cross culture, cross boundary, cross globe kind of things. So that that's kind of that's dragged on. Plus the, you know, various people involved, you know, succumbing to COVID and getting better and 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 all that. Um, so that's taken quite a bit of this year and and working uh, uh, like Orteca's most recent album. Um, various indie record labels, uh, dance record and, and uh, you know, sort of techno and things like that seem to be, have been impacted less um, from my perspective, because they're still, they're still putting music out. So whether it's digital or physical or whether it's a limited run or unlimited run, it doesn't really matter. They still, if, if they need a cover, they need a cover. If they need an image, they need an image. So I've been working on a lot of stuff like that. I've been working with uh, a distillery in, um, in, well, just outside Budapest in Hungary. And it's an alcohol distillery, but it's, it's pure alcohol, not you know, drinking alcohol. They supply, they have in the past supplied um, a lot of alcohol to people who make uh, hand sanitizers. Um, Obviously, demand has increased uh, exponentially this year, and they've started to make their own hand sanitizer. So I've been working on the branding um, with that. So that, that's kind of quite weird. That's through uh, another client that's uh, got a content management system business in Budapest. So that, that so that's 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 kind of been kind of quite on topic, you know. Um, so, so our family has a vast array of hand sanitizers and cleansers for research that you could possibly people kind of think are a bit weird when if they, you know, when they could come into the house. Um, I can't. Well, I'm sure I'm working on some other stuff. I mean, there's just there's there's kind of. There's, there's kind of work which has just trailed off, you know, where, where I've been working with, uh, as a consultant with, you know, big entertainment and big leisure kind of companies, you know, who have had to close. Um, and it, it kind of f it feels worse now because there was always the sense that by the end of the year we'll be up and running. So it was just, you're just treading water. But in some ways you see that, that the, the problem now is nobody really knows what the landscape's going to look like 
if and when clubs open again. So we can't, so the idea was for a lot of the year, I've spent time talking to them about, about how they're going to, how they can hit the floor running when clubs open again and, you know, sort of hopefully sort of steal, a, uh, you know, a bit of, just get ahead of other people. But, but, but we don't know now, you know, and there's a, there's, there's sort of something that kind of, what is the message if you are, if, if, they are, if I am on their behalf, talking to an audience about events that might happen in summer 2021, what kind of language do we, do we use to, to communicate that? Because we have to be really sensitive because, you know, you can be really optimistic and say, yeah, you know, like kind of let's, we, we can't wait for summer 2021, et cetera, et cetera. But there will be people for whom summer 2021 will be even worse than than it is now you know so that we don't i think we're less confident in well for me with my clients but i think in general we're everybody's less confident now about how how we communicate the near future um and what what will each of our worlds be like you know so so that so that's it so Again, some of some of the stuff that I've been doing over this year is now kind of redundant because of that. Um, and I've also spent a lot of time, sometimes getting paid and sometimes not, but 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 thinking about how we communicate things in future. Because you know, we we've we've become quite it's been I find I've found it easier easy in the past to communicate things in a way that some people find surprising uh, because we be in general we've had the luxury of becoming lazy about how we communicate things um, and and so sometimes it's it's quite easy to deliberately shock people by doing something that's not normal or not perceived to be normal now under sort of you know under the covid cloud you know it, it's we have to think about not just how we communicate things but what are we communicating mm. and, and and some of the frivolities that the the graphic designers have been able to um exploit if you like in the past as, as kind of some kind of infotainment now just sort of it, it just kind of seems a little too trite so but you know tomorrow's another day i also find it difficult to give general advice to students uh, and, and graduates because i think that i think that you know it, it's that the if you really want to be a designer, want to be a problem solver, want to be a visual communicator, you work out how to do it for yourself and you work out the best, the best way to do it for yourself. So maybe that's a piece of advice. Um, it's, it, it, it's difficult. Each person finds their own way and each person finds their own way based on their ambition or aspirations. So those, there are people who want to kind of, go out on their own and freelance and make their own way and do work on their own ideas and collaborate with their own connect people they're connected to. And that's good. And there are other people who, who are better suited to working in a, a team environment in a larger agency. And that's fine too. But, but there's that in, that's kind of two very different skill sets. I think, I mean, there's the physical activity of design, but actually the reality is that, once you get out into the real world, your your ability to design, to use typography, photography, uh, direct creatively or artistically, all those things kind of go in one box that's kind of half the job at best. And everything else goes into people's skills. So if you go out on your own, then you've got to have the skills of running a a small business by yourself and then do you take if you become successful do you take people on and then do you become like an employer and all those kind of things 
uh, or if you go to work, you know, and you have to work in a team environment um, in a bigger agency, how do you fit into the team? And if you're ambitious, how do you make that teamwork work, working as a group work well for you? Um, how do you communicate with clients? What is it that they want you to do for them? Who are you doing it for? And I think all those things. So in some ways, you know, maybe that's the advice is, is to think about those things and to think about, always think about your creativity in the context of what your creative is, creativity is being used for, both by you, your client, and you, the, any target or ambient audiences um, consuming your work. So it's, I think, I think I would say if there's some advice, I'd consider those things. Advice on, you know, I would say also some advice is to, you know, it's difficult, you know, we're, 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 we're being forced to break habits and, and change our behavior. So education is different and social interaction is different. So it, puts a lot of pressure or a lot of pressure but a lot of focus on on the young on students and young designers to to find their own way and to to keep pushing but then again I would say that if you're going to be a decent designer then you probably need to do that anyway and you know that you need to just that that even if you're going into even if you're going into college or art school or university every day of the week for like 30 weeks of the year uh, under normal circumstances you know you still have to push yourself and find your own way so so maybe things aren't so different i think the other thing is now more than ever is you need to be true to yourself about what you think you should do you know, if you really, really think hard about what it is you want to do at the end, you don't have to, you, if you make a decision now, you can change that. But I mean, you know, do you want to, do you want to be a lifestyle designer where, you know, you go and work in an agency and you work your way up and maybe you get your own agency one day and you deal with clients and, you know, you, you have a nice, neat consumer client facing office you know, or are you be are you better suited? You know, do you want to? Would you rather do what you want to do and potentially rough it, but at least get creative satisfaction that way? It doesn't have to be those two extremes. But where do you want to fit in? And I think it's really more important now than ever um, with the changing landscape in terms of employment and where you work and who you work with and why that you that you have a a, a clear idea of where you want to position yourself because I think that the reality is that in the past you could jump blindly into the real world from university and land in a safety net somewhere and then maybe swap nets throughout but I don't think those safety nets are there necessarily so I don't think that there's uh, necessarily a lack of opportunity it's just you need to if 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 people are, if people who are already have studios i mean i'm talking about like you know employees are changing the way that they work and maybe not maybe working at home and having less or having smaller studios then the, the safety nets are smaller so i think working out what it is that you really want to do and spending time working out how to get there rather than just imagining that someone somewhere is going to want you. It's probably a question of having to mentally think beyond university and education more than you, more than people had to in the past.